Um, our first speaker is Dr. Dantas, who is a professor in immunology and pathology. And um, his research really focuses on um, understanding the reserves of microbial antibiotic resistance. Um, in addition to that, he also um, does research on uh, microbial catalysis of, uh, um, of plant biomass and how we can isolate chemicals from that. But today he'll be talking about antibiotic resistance and we're really excited to have him. So I'll hand off the microphone. Great, thank you. How's that? Well, thank you so much for coming. Uh, I know the three of us stand between you and game six, so we'll try to go quickly. Um, so yeah, so I'm an assistant professor in pathology and immunology. I have a, a secondary appointment in biomedical engineering, and my lab is uh, in the Center for Genome Sciences uh, and Systems Biology. And I mentioned that because we use a lot of genomic approaches towards understanding the type of problems we care about. Um, uh, before I get to, to talk about a couple of vignettes about uh, what we work on, I just want to acknowledge the group currently, um, uh, and in particular to point out that um, we strongly believe in, uh, uh, in interdisciplinary approaches towards solving problems, both on the basic science and the applied side. Uh, and so we've been very fortunate to draw uh, students from, uh, uh, f uh, graduate students from four of the DBBS programs, uh, 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 postdocs from a couple different departments, uh, and then also a really exciting group of undergrads and technicians uh, in the lab. And so before I get to this one specific area of antibiotic resistance, I just want to tell you what inspires our work and, and how we treat everything is recognizing that we live on this planet that's dominated by microbial activity. Uh, and we recognize that, um, that, that, that what's incredible is that this, this activity, the metabolic potential of microbes, uh, is something that can easily be hot swapped between microbes uh, through this process called horizontal gene transfer. So it is uh, this willy-nilly exchange of phenotypes uh, by the simple exchange of genotypes. And this uh, has, as, as uh, was mentioned, um, uh, a lot of engineering potential. And so that is you can essentially treat any microbe or group of microbes as a grab bag of genes that can be repurposed uh, for their functions in a different group of microbes. And so uh, this is sort of the, uh, the, the underpinnings of synthetic biology. Uh, but then also we recognize that, the, that this arsenal of metabolic functions in different types of microbes uh, can sometimes challenge our ability uh, to live healthily. Uh, and it's in this specific area that I'll talk about um, uh, uh, some of these sort of translational goals. Um, and so specifically what I'm here to talk to you about is our interest in antibiotics and antibiotic resistance. And so what are antibiotics? The clinical definition of an antibiotic is uh, any chemical that at a specific concentration can either inhibit the growth of or completely kill very specific microbes, right? That's how we think of antibiotics from a hospital perspective. Uh, and here are some of the, you know, the, the key members, the chemicals that constitute antibiotics. And rather than focus on the details, what I really wanted to observe is that what they do, the reason these chemicals work is that they hit extremely conserved cellular processes. And hopefully that you'll, you'll end also with recognizing why this is really important in that even though these antibiotics are, are thought of as, as, as compounds to kill pathogens, for instance, because these processes that they target are conserved, they do actually collaterally impact any microbe that they actually interact with. Um, so, why is this a problem? Well, it turns out because of this collateral damage and because of this high selection pressure of antibiotics, the history of antibiotic use in the clinic and the occurrence of antibiotic resistance are extremely intricately linked. And so this is shown in this particular uh, uh, kind of scary and, and sad plot. Uh, so across this x-axis in time, uh, Along the top are all of the major classes of antibiotics that we use and the dates that were deployed. And the corresponding uh, label and color below is when clinical antibiotic resistance is observed. Uh, and hopefully you can see there's nothing along the top that doesn't have a corresponding spot along the bottom. If you use antibiotics against the pathogen, it's just a matter of when antibiotic resistance will occur, not a question of if. Uh, and so what's the burden? Uh, well, as it turns out, um, uh, infections from uh, antibiotic resistant organisms are on the rise, have been uh, essentially from the advent of the antibiotic era. Uh, 
And it's captured, for instance, in, uh, in numbers like this, where methicillin resistance staph aureus, aureus or MRSA, which is often in the news, one multi-drug resistant bacterium kills more people in this country than does HIV AIDS. That's just one of these nasty bugs. And here is the real perfect storm. So if you look at over time again now, across these, these, uh, uh, these, these lines that are going up, those are infection rates from three drug resistant bacteria. And at the same time, while these, these bugs have been increasing, the infections from these multi-drug resistant organisms in this country and, and outside, at the same time, the development of new antibiotics, which is shown in blue, and the approval by the FDA has been diving. Uh, this is the, uh, the number of drugs coming to market. This is the number of drugs that are being developed by uh, any pharmaceutical company. So that, that's why it's called this perfect storm. You've got more resistance and less, less drugs to, to hit the resistant bugs. And here's what this, this causes. So just in the United States alone, the burden from, from the, tr for the required treatment and often failure of just the drug resistant infections uh, 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 translates into $35 billion of excess healthcare costs uh, and about 8 million additional hospital days and roughly 23,000 deaths that could have been prevented if there was a drug to treat that particular infection. Uh, and so what our lab is really intricately interested in understanding uh, uh, in, in about half our effort is how is it this antibiotic resistance evolves and what can we do about it? Uh, and so we recognize from sort of the molecular perspective that the way a large number of pathogens acquire antibiotic resistance is through this process of horizontal gene transfer. The ability of one bacterium to exchange DNA with another bacterium, and in this case the DNA would encode the antibiotic resistance gene. There are, there are particular processes that are described, and these have been known for decades. Uh, conjugation, for instance, is the process of direct bacterial transfer. Transformation is the ability of certain bacteria to take up DNA from the environment. Transduction is the process by which phages, viruses that infect bacteria, can move things around. But that's the, that's the details. The important part is there are lots of ways in which bacteria can exchange DNA between each other. What's important to recognize, and this is something that we focus a lot on, is that this doesn't only occur pathogen to pathogen. But because of this promiscuity in the bacterial world, it can happen between essentially any two microbial habitats. So a pathogen can exchange DNA uh, with microbes essentially anywhere. Uh, good, good bugs that live in and on the body, microbes in the environment, microbes associated with animals, for instance. And this, this fundamental concept of horizontal gene transfer between different habitats uh, is something that we, uh, we try to explore and try to understand if this occurs what is the importance of it in terms of uh, antibiotic resistance increasing in the clinic? And I'll just give you one vignette in terms of how we've applied new technologies to look at um, what might not seem like an obvious habitat to study in terms of this problem, and that's the soil. Uh, so uh, this is a little bit of a detail, but I want to mention it because it's something that really fundamentally changed how we were able to look at this problem. This is how a microbiologist in, say, a clinic or at, at the bench would traditionally look at antibiotic resistance, right? This is, some of you may have heard of this thing called Cox postulates, this old idea that if you want to understand the etiology or the cause of a particular disease, you need to figure out the specific bug that causes the disease, and then you follow a set of rules to take that individual bug and do a bunch of things with it. Here's a way in which you can do that. You can start with a source, say a spit sample or a fecal sample or a blood sample, and then go through a process where you culture out these bacteria, take individual bacteria or colonies of them, uh, and then do all sorts of fun things with them, right? You can test their susceptibility to drugs. You can, in this modern age, sequence their genomes, figure out what the resistance is. Unfortunately, it turns out that most microbes don't live alone. They live in communities, and most communities are so diverse uh, that, for instance, communities in the human body or in the soil, for instance, that those culture-based methods basically are not adequate for describing the properties of those communities in total. And so instead what we use are methods that try to look at communities of microbes, and in, in this particular case, their resistance genes en masse without any culturing bias. And so this is, and this is what I was talking about, the busy schematic, but I think it's important to, 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 uh, uh, to go through uh, because the, the bottom line is this basically changed the scale of what we can do by about a hundredfold. So essentially what we do is we treat microbes as grab bags of genes. So in this case, we extract all of the genomic DNA in all of the microbes from a community at the same time. Uh, we go through a, a, what's called a cloning experiment. So this is a case where the, the random pieces of DNA are put into some sort of expression system, which in a specific bacterium can be translated into proteins. Uh, and, and, and this is done in an easy to work with bacterium, say, for instance, E. coli. And then what you have is a, it's, a, it's a sort of traditional recombinant DNA experiment where what you've got is a metagenomic library 
which can be selected for against some sort of um, um, uh, a condition that would kill um, uh, any of the untransformed microbes. And so essentially what you're doing here is going through a massive functional bottleneck so that the only things that you would now interrogate are microbes that have picked up a resistance gene, picked up a, a chunk of DNA from this original source that is an antibiotic resistance gene. And then of course the devil is in the details. Here, uh, this, the next few steps involve some next generation sequencing uh, and a bunch of computational tools which essentially allow you to take the, 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 the DNA which you don't know what it is up here and be able to uh, then predict exactly what the gene functions are. Um, and again, the, the, the main deliverable from this method is that uh, because it's done in high throughput, it's much cheaper, about 100 times cheaper than the traditional methods. And most importantly, the throughput, that is the identity of the resistance genes that come through, are completely agnostic of any kind of prior bias. So you do not need to know what the resistance genes were up in uh, before you go into this process which means that uh, it allows you to potentially discover the problem before it occurs. Uh, and so we use that, I'll give, just give you a couple uh, slides to describe a project which we completed last year, uh, which sheds light on a habitat in terms of antibiotic resistance, which maybe not everyone thinks about. And that is microbes or bacteria that are associated with the soil. So why think of the soil resistome or the collection of resistance genes in the soil? Well, there's a whole body of work, about you know five decades worth of work, and I'll, uh, highlight three particular important points which made us come to this. One is that resistance in the soil has actually been shown to be ancient. So in this particular study, uh, folks in Canada went to uh, the ca Canadian Beringian permafrost. They went down and cored to a level where they could date the material down to 30,000 years and then shotgun sequenced the DNA there. And in that DNA from 30,000 years ago, they were able to find antibiotic resistance genes. Clearly showing that antibiotic resistance in bacteria existed well before we came on the scene, certainly in terms of any therapeutic use. Why would that be expected? Well, it turns out about 40 years ago, Julian Davies and colleagues uh, uh, posited that most antibiotic chemicals that we use in the clinic are actually natural products. We went out and found bacteria in the soil that make these compounds, and then we overexpress them and use them in the clinic. So it makes sense that if these bacteria have been in the soil for millions to billions of years making these drugs, they have the self-immunity elements to basically resist them. So the idea is the producers have the resistance genes and maybe the original progenitors of resistance. And finally, in cases where people have been able to do these experiments, so for instance, in this European study, they were able to show that basically over 70 years of archival soils, they were able to show that key antibiotic resistance gene levels increased. So you've got, the, you've got all of the, the evidence to suggest that the soil is an important reservoir of resistance, which should be accessed uh, by clinical pathogens. So it makes sense, it should. And yet, around the time that we started this particular investigation a couple years ago, there were very, very scarce examples of exact genes in the soil which had been seen in pathogens. Uh, so this is sort of the bar to say something has been exchanged recently to say, do I find the exact same resistance gene in non-pathogens and pathogens? So we decided to set up to look at that. Uh, and so we did a, a fairly simple experiment. We went to um, the bacteria in the soil that we thought might have these properties but still were non-pathogenic. We did actually culture them up in media that contain antibiotics at high concentrations, extracted their bulk DNA, and then interrogated their resistance genes with that method I told you about called functional metagenomics. And here's what we found. Unlike what had been seen before, we were able to find several ex seven examples of resistance genes from these non-pathogenic soil bacteria that were exactly the same as genes that had been found in pathogens. And not only, these were not one-off events. Between these seven genes, they were able to inactivate five different classes of antibiotics. Uh, they represent all of the major resistance against antibiotics that we know in terms of mechanisms. Uh, and this is perhaps the scary part. So this is a non-exhaustively colored map of countries where the pathogens were deposited, where the genes were identical to the, th to the three different US sites that we got the non-pathogenic isolates. Suggesting that this problem is global, uh, it's old and global, and probably because there's so much transfer of humans across the planet, you can have these exchanges that can occur pretty rapidly. Uh, challenging what happens in, in the clinic. And then finally, again, don't worry about all the details of the numbers, but basically we were able to go back and actually isolate the specific non-pathogenic bacteria that had these traits. Uh, and, and the reason I only have this slide up here is to say that these, these particular non-pathogenic isolates happen to come from a soil which had been treated with manure from animals that had taken antibiotics. So now this becomes to perhaps tell us why these exchanges are occurring. And in the next few slides I'll talk about uh, uh, something that's a little bit outside the realm of what I, my lab regularly studies, but what I think explains some of these results.
And that's this recognition that in this country, over 80% of antibiotics by weight are used in food animal agriculture. Less than 20% are actually used in the clinic. Uh, the majority of use of that use is non-therapeutic. So what I mean is those drugs are not used to treat infections. They're used at sub-therapeutic concentrations because they make those animals bigger. So that way we can pay less for our meat. Uh, and here is the major challenge, something that uh, from a policy perspective would make the biggest difference here in terms of the research, would be to convince our government and our regulatory agencies to simply require the reporting of that antibiotic use. Not to ban it, not to change it, but just to require the people who use those antibiotics to tell us how much they use and what they use. They're not required to do that right now. You need to do that in the hospital, you don't need to do that in agriculture. Uh, and, and here's the problem. So most of the meat that we get in this country comes from these concentrated agricultural feeding operations. And you can read the quote, but essentially, if you think about the conditions that these animals are reared in, uh, essentially, they grow in their own feces and the feces of their, of their, their progenitors. Uh, and essentially, we can think of this as about the worst kind of hospital environment you might imagine, where antibiotics are used all the time, but things are sick, um, and but essentially, nothing ever gets cleaned out. So it's perhaps not all that surprising that these might be the specific environments where antibiotic resistant exchange might occur. And there's good data to suggest that this really might be occurring. So this is data, for instance, that shows that you take a drug like the quinolones. Now, the quinolones are some of these drugs of last resort. Some of you may remember the anthrax scare that occurred in the early 2000s. There's only one drug that was stockpiled, ciprofloxacin, that could have prevented some of these anthrax infections. When a, a, a drug in exactly that same class was approved for use in poultry in the United States, you can now see the incredible increase in quinolone resistance directly in proportion to use of that particular drug, even though that was supposed to be one of the drugs that was saved for humans. And what happens if you, as a country, make changes in your use of antibiotics? And so here's examples from Germany and Belgium. You can ban specific antimicrobials, which you know cause problems in agriculture, and then begin to see dramatic reductions in fairly short timescales in the antibiotic resistance burden. So these are things that other countries have tried, they've been successful at, but for some reason we've not been able to do that in the US. Uh, and so the global numbers do suggest that we can do something about it. The issue is that without the high throughput methods, which are now only coming into effect, it's, you can do a lot of causality types of predictions, but the, uh, sorry, a lot of correlation type predictions, but, but establishing causality becomes a problem. And so this is usually what the food manufacturers come back to us with and say, well, you can't actually tell me that this outbreak in a human was caused because of contaminated meat from an animal that took antibiotics. Um, even though we feel that uh, that's, that's essentially an exercise to the reader based on all of the data that we have. Um, and so with that, um, what can we do about this since we we're talk, uh, told to talk about policy to some extent? Well, it turns out there's, a, there's a, an advocacy group uh, that has been around for a while now called the Alliance for the Prudent Use of Antibiotics. They promote the prudent use of antibiotics both in the clinic and agriculture. I just thought I'd show you uh, what seemed to me like very, very straightforward suggestions from them, which is essentially have fallen on deaf ears in terms of the regulatory agencies. And so one is this uh, pretty simple idea that antibiotics should only be used in the presence of disease. Uh, that they should be only used for animals when they're prescribed by a veterinarian. So essentially most antibiotic use is basically over the counter uh, uh, for agriculture. Uh, that it should be, uh, that, that basically the data that I talked about should be made publicly available. Um, that there should be a fair amount of research effort put into the ecology of antibiotic resistance. To get away from some of this idea of single bugs, to understand that different environments are indeed linked, that, that selection pressures in one environment impact other environments. Um, that, uh, that this should be taken into account by regulatory agencies. Uh, that, that there should be money and efforts put into surveillance programs. So basically we can hopefully find out if an issue is going to occur before it does and not always must sort of be reactionary. And then finally, uh, and this is an, an, a particular research area to figure out alternatives. So to, to look at things that are not antibiotics, for instance, that could still be used to treat infectious disease. And these are all areas on their own that deserve their own attention, but these are just, just things that uh, you can go away to think about uh, uh, changes that could be made. Um, and so with that, I'm, I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to go through all of the other uh, potential problems. I'll just say that, there, that uh, 
perhaps the most important part of this spectrum is finding new antibiotics, right? We can do as much as we want in terms of understanding resistance, but hopefully I've convinced you that essentially nature will find a way, evolution will find a way, and the, we're not gonna fix this problem simply by understanding resistance in better detail. We need to find new antibiotics. Uh, and so uh, with that, uh, I'll stop and hand off to the other speakers. I had one more slide about what work they're doing, we're doing for combination therapies, but I'm happy to discuss that. Uh, at a different time. And of course, I'll end by thanking uh, the folks in my lab uh, and many folks at WashU and the funders for the kind of stuff we do. So. so we have time for two, maybe three questions. Does anyone have any questions for Dr. Thomas? I'll to somebody else. <laughs> sure, go ahead. But I'll, I can talk so, to you later. Yes, sir. <laughs> Alright, so you, you know, you talked about the study where they looked in like the soil and they discovered the, like antibiotics from or antibiotic resistant genes from ancient times in bacteria. But they weren't I don't know what they about the medicine back in ancient times, but were they using antibiotics to treat people who got diseased back then? Thirty thousand years ago? No. Yeah, why were these why are these antibiotic resistant genes hanging around? Right. And so that really goes back to this producer hypothesis, which I know I sort of zoomed through real quickly, but it's this idea that the bacteria that produce antibiotics have been in the soil for millions of years. And they have the capacity to produce them, so they themselves, to not commit suicide, need to have resistance mechanisms. Because remember that these drugs target key cellular processes, so that they target the cell wall or the protein translation machinery in the, in the producing organism in exactly the same way that they would do a pathogen. So the idea is that since they've had these production capacities, they've had the resistance genes. Uh, but also keep in mind that because these are e ecologies, these are communities, they probably also had the same selection pressure with their neighbors over millions of years. So the idea is that the reason we see resistance in the soil that's ancient is not actually because of anthropogenic use, because it clearly predates any kind of anthropogenic use. It's because of this natural history. Uh, and that actually is, uh, is, is perhaps the most important takeaway from this is that when we use antibiotics and cause selection, we're not requiring the evolution of brand new functions. All of the functions already exist there. Right? So antibiotic resistance is already out there, just at low levels perhaps. As soon as we have the selection pressure, bacteria can rapidly evolve to acquire them and increase their rates. And so this is different, for instance, than say radiation contamination damage, where you might have to require lots of evolution to occur because that's not necessarily a natural property. These are natural properties of, of soil ecosystems and other natural ecosystems, which can then be acquired and cause problems in the clinic. So it sort of casts shadow on, 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 on trying to find new antibiotics because if, if the evolution has sort of you know, fought against, against it already for a long time, then, then you're probably going to see resistance even to, to the things that we haven't used yet. That's absolutely true. And so again, the development of antibiotics is something that we need to think of as a continual measure. We're not going to find, so Ehrlich proposed, Paul Ehrlich proposed this idea of the magic bullet. There is no magic bullet out there, I would predict. Um, now, that's, that's from the perspective of antibiotics as we think of them traditionally. These molecules that are broad spectrum that go after key cellular processes and hence provide ample selection pressure for any random mutant in the population to become resistant. And as you mentioned, uh, it, this, it's probably already out there. On the other hand, some of the more novel therapies and novel strategies that are being considered now is maybe to say, look, it's not the fact that I don't like a pathogen because of uh, it's antibiotic resistance. I don't like it because of its virulence, right? Because it's causing a disease in my body. So what I need to do is simply s select against the virulence factor, perhaps. So there are people who are de developing very targeted narrow spectrum therapies to say, you know, I have, I have an entire E. coli population. Maybe most of that is not really problematic. It's only the one that has a particular pilus or a particular adhesion molecule. And if I can knock that out, First of all, then I'm counting against the virulence guys, and I'm also not giving as much selection pressure because as long as that E. coli can survive without the virulence, I'm not killing it. I'm just saying don't express the virulence. And so that's one way in which we might be able to get around this evolutionary process. But if you're going to make traditional antibiotics, you basically need to keep making more of them. All right. Thank you, Dr.